Hi everyone, I'm Mary Ann. I'm a licensed insolvency trustee with Allen Marshall and Associates, also known as Dr. Debt because I help people have happier, healthier finances. So today I want to talk to you about credit worthiness. And I came up with this because I'm often talking to individuals or clients about credit scores. We get very focused on credit scores, but there's other aspects to credit, credit worthiness that I think are important to consider and take into account. So I thought I'd do a little educational um, presentation on this. Let's begin. Let's try to begin. Let me get on the right screen. Uh, okay, so I am going to start by talking about your credit score because really, you know, this is a crucial piece and having some understanding of it is important. Now, this is going to be, you know, a very um, broad overview of everything. If there's anything that you would like me to go into more detail about, just post it in the comments and I will happily do a presentation that goes into more detail. But I just want to explain for anyone who doesn't know what a credit score is and, um, and why it's important, uh, it's defined as an at a glance indicator that lenders use to estimate your probability of successful loan repayment. Loosely translated, that means it determines whether or not you will get credit or in today's world, I don't know if you've noticed getting credit is really not an issue. Um, it's more what you're going to pay for the credit that you get. So the interest rate. So the higher the score, the better interest rate you're going to pay, the lower the interest rate you're going to pay, the lower your score, the higher interest rate you're going to pay. So credit scores range from about three to 900. Now, depending on where you get your credit score, the rating systems might be slightly different. So I'm not going to go into where to get your score in detail, but I will let you know there's two main credit reporting agencies in Canada, Equifax and TransUnion. That's where your information comes from. Or you may use a third party such as um, Credit Karma or Borowell or your bank, but they're pulling information from one of these two sources. So generally speaking, your scores range from three to 900. If the score is around three to 600, it's poor. If it's six to 650, it's fair. If it's 650 to about 720, it's good. If it's 720 to 800, it's very good. And if it's eight to 900, it is excellent. I have yet to meet anyone with a 900 score, although I have met some people who have very high 800 scores. So here are the things that impact your score. And as you can see, there are two things that have the most impact, your payment history and your debt status. The other three, which have less of an impact, but are equally as important, are the types of credit you have, the inquiries or credit checks that have been done on you and the length of credit. And we're gonna talk about each one of these in detail. We're gonna start with the lowest percentage. We're gonna move up to the highest. So 10% of your score is based on your type of credit. If you don't have credit, you have no or minimal credit score. Now, I've not actually met anyone who has, doesn't have some type of credit score. So what happens is you will have a score, but it will be low. And I never realized what that would be. But recently, I helped my 20-year-old son start to look at his credit score for the first time. He has had no credit. And we got him signed up, and his score was in the low 600s. I was pleasantly surprised. I'm like, OK, that's not a bad starting place to be. So obviously, there is this kind of starting point where you're not kind of thrown down into the trenches of having a poor credit credit score, you're kind of put somewhere in the middle. So that's not a bad starting point. So if you've never had credit, you're going to have a low credit score. I'll have to change that on this slide. Uh, I did want to mention that if you have joint debt or co-signed debt, it may or may not be reported to your credit, uh, credit bureau. So you may not be getting credit for it pun intended. So really just check your reports, see what's there. Um, lenders do report these differently. So just because your name is on credit, you may not be getting any benefit of that. Now, that's assuming it's paid up to date, because if it's not, maybe you don't want to be getting credit or no credit because of it. We're going to talk about that in a moment. Where you get your credit matters. So if you have credit at banks versus high interest lending places, you're going to have a stronger credit score. So the main five banks would be considered A lenders. And then as you get into the high interest lenders, they start to be termed B and C lenders. If you deal with finance companies, for example, you will see your credit score drop. 
So that's something to be aware of. So you know those no payment, no deal, uh, no, sorry, no payment, no interest deals um, that you sign up for. And then, you know, hopefully you pay them off in full, no pay any interest because they go through high finance companies, you likely will see your score drop. So just be aware of that. The other point is that you do want different types of credit. So revolving and installment credit. Revolving means credit that changes. You have some control over this. You can use it and pay it at different intervals. Credit cards, lines of credit, they're always changing in their balances. Installment loans are fixed. You have a loan, it's a set amount you've borrowed, you have a set payment and you have a set term. Ideally, you want to have both of these types of credit because they will improve your credit score. If you have only credit cards, lines of credit, you're going to have a lower score. If you have only loans, you're going to have a lower score. Not only that, but it might be difficult, even if you have a decent score, to get revolving credit if you've never had it. And the same goes for loans. So just be conscious of the type of credit that you have. All right. Let's look at inquiries. So when we look at inquiries, again, it's only 10% of your score, but it can have a major impact depending on the other elements. There's two types of inquiries that I want you to be aware of, hard and soft. Hard impact you, soft do not. So hard inquiries would be applications for new credit. Pretty much that's it. Everything else is a soft inquiry. So examples, if you have a current loan with a current place and they're doing updates to see whether or not they need to do something to your credit, which usually means increase your rates, um, don't even get me started on that, then they're going to do an inquiry that will not impact your credit score. If you check your report or a third party credit place checks it, that's not going to impact it. So that would be those credit karma or well, your bank. If you apply to rent a place or you are getting insurance or you apply for a job and they do a credit check, those are soft inquiries. So they are not going to impact your credit score. Now, as a general rule of thumb, each credit inquiry should only reduce your score by a boat less than five points. However, I have seen this play out in very different ways for other people, depending on the circumstances. Um, again, as a general rule of thumb, keep your credit inquiries below three per, per year and don't have them close together. So if you do three inquiries in a week or a month, that's going to have a different impact than if you did three inquiries over a year. So that's inquiries. Now we're moving into 15%. That is your length of credit, which is typically how long you have had credit. And the bottom line is the longer you've had it, the better it will be. So someone who has had credit for 20 or 30 years is gonna have a higher score than someone who's only had credit for the last two or three years. The other thing you want to be aware of is that if you get new credit, it's going to lower the score. And that's because it's changing the average length of time you have had credit. So let's just say you have a uh, credit card and you've had it for 30 years and you have a loan and you've had it for uh, 10 years, right? So the average is 20. So 30 and 10, the average is 20. Now, let's say that you go and get three new credit cards for whatever reason. They're points cards, you're doing a balance transfer, um, you know, there's something that you get because of them, but they're all brand new. So now you have five pieces of credit over an average of um, 30 years. And so, you know, do the math, which I should be able to do in my head, but I'm not going there. Uh, but it's going to be it's going to be a lower percentage than the one from the first example. Let's just go with that. So it's going to reduce the average length of time that you've had credit and it is going to cause your score to drop. If you cancel old cards, it will also lower the score. So let's say you canceled that 30 year credit card that you had. That's going to drop your um, average time that you've had credit by quite a bit. So the good news is typically you can rebound from these things fairly quickly, but you might need six to 12 months or so to do so, just depending on the other things that are happening. So the bottom line is the longer you have had credit, the stronger your score, and just be aware of that. All right, the two big ones, 30% is your debt status. So how much of your available credit do you use? As a general rule of thumb, you want to keep it below 30%. What does that mean? That means if you have a $1,000 credit card, you don't want to carry more than a $300 balance. And if you do, it's going to drop your score. Now, if you get up to your limit or you go over your limit, 
it's going to drop it drastically. And just as a side note, it's going to also increase your interest rate. It's a double-edged sword. So be very conscious of how much of your credit you're using. And I do recommend that you try to keep it below 30% if possible. So that's really all I wanted to say about that one. Um, payment history is a big one, right? 35%, this is the biggest, it makes sense. Do you pay on time? And what happens is every creditor gives you a rating and the ratings go from one to nine. Now zero's in there, Jeff, that means account open, doesn't have a real big impact. Generally speaking, your ratings go from one to nine. One means you have paid as agreed up to date and on time. Two means you missed a payment. Three means you missed two payments and so on. When you get down to the bottom numbers, seven means the account's been settled in some way. So usually through a proposal or informal debt settlement. Eight means there's been a repossession. And nine means the account is written off or it's gone to collections or it's released under a bankruptcy. So obviously, as you start to get down into the, you know, six, seven, eight, nines or up into the six, seven, eight, nines, your score is going to start to drop dramatically. So payment history. Do you pay? Do you pay on time? Or has there been any hiccups along the way? That is going to impact your score the most. All right, so let's go back to the title of this presentation. We talked about credit, we're talking about credit worthiness. There are three parts to credit worthiness. What we did is we just went into the credit score uh, in fairly detailed, although I didn't go deep. And I'm making that distinction because I could go deeper on each one of those elements to talk more about it. And again, I do invite you, if there are any questions unanswered, post them in the comments, and I will be happy to do a deep dive on any of these in a future post. In the meantime, let's continue. So credit score is one aspect, but we need to talk about debt ratio, and we need to talk about income or job stability to get the full picture of credit worthiness. So we went into credit score, which is based on your credit repayment history and more. We're going to talk about debt ratio, which is how much debt you have compared to your income. And we're going to talk about income and job stability, which, which relies on a lot of factors, whether or not you're employed or self-employed or how long you've been employed or what type of income you have. Ready? Debt ratio. So debt ratio is how much debt you owe to your income. And lenders use this to determine how well you manage monthly debts and if you can afford to repay a loan. Now, I wrote a little note on this slide that says ratio spatio because I'm not a fan of ratios and percentages. I'm just not. I think that you really need to look at individual circumstances. However, there are guidelines out there and it doesn't hurt to be aware of them. So as a general rule of thumb, your housing should not be more than about 30% of your gross income. So this is your gross income. Total debt should not be more than about 40% of your gross income. Now, you know, the distinction I like to make here is if you are a homebody and your home is the most important thing to you, and let's say that you want, I don't know, a home on the ocean and it's going to cost more. Maybe a ratio for home is going to be more. That's okay as long as you are willing to give up some of the other ratios to support that. And that's a whole nother presentation on making good financial decisions. But I did want to just pull that out of there. When you look at your credit report, so if you look at the, the little picture in the center, the 8%, um, that's just a snippet of one of the credit reporting places. And that person's debt ratio is 8%. So it's 8% of their gross income. So you're actually going to see your debt ratio in your credit report when you get it, along with your credit score, because it's part of the credit worthiness formula and it's important. That's debt ratio. So the last one in credit worthiness is your income or employment situation. Again, pretty straightforward. Are you employed? For how long? Have you changed employment? A little note that if you are with the same industry, but you've changed employment, it may not be considered a change of employment. In other words, you get credit for the fact that you're still in the same industry. Just a little note of interest. Are you self-employed? If so, for how long? What is your net income? Now that's an interesting point because if you are self-employed, chances are you are trying to write off as much of your income as you can for tax purposes. And that's great for tax purposes. It's not great for credit worthiness because it will show a very low 
net income, which is going to impact your debt ratio. And also it looks a little worse for the success of your business. So just another thing to consider. Now, some lenders will use your gross business income. They're probably not going to be the A lenders. They're likely going to be the B and C lenders. And that goes back to credit score and how it impacts that. So you can see how this all plays together. And of course, you'll have to provide a history of your tax returns in order to provide some historic data on your income, unless you're very newly self-employed, um, which, you know, generally speaking, again, will have a fairly major impact on your ability to get credit. Um, all right, so, and then I put a little note there that says an inquiry for employment will not affect your credit score, which we already talked about. So that's income job stability. That is the three parts of credit worthiness. So you need to have a strong credit score, you need to have a low debt ratio, and you need to have income or job stability in order to support your credit worthiness. I don't know what I was, how I was going to wrap that up. Um, your ability to get credit. How about that? So, you know, if you take any one of these out, did I do this on the next slide? Um, no. So if you take any one of these out, it is going to impact your ability to get credit. And so it, it, I'm just, okay, let me just do the thing that popped up on the slide and then I'm going to do that. So the sweet spot is where all three criteria are strong, right? Right here in the middle. That's your sweet spot. And so going back to what I was saying, let's say you have an excellent debt ratio. You owe very little money. You have an excellent job, but your credit score is tanked. You're going to have difficulty getting credit. Let's say that your credit score is very strong and you don't owe a lot of money. You don't have a job. You're going to have issue getting credit. And we'll do the last one. Let's say you have an excellent credit score, you have an excellent job, but you owe too much money. You're going to have difficult getting credit. So that's why the sweet spot is in the center where all three meet. It doesn't mean that they all have to be strong. One can be a little weaker and it can still qualify you for credit or decent interest rate, but ultimately you in, are in your best negotiating position when you hit that sweet spot right there in the middle. All right. Well, that concludes this very brief presentation on credit worthiness. I hope that it helps to explain why all three are important, why you don't want to just focus on your credit score and gives you a more holistic look at your credit worthiness overall. Now, this is not live, so I can't take your questions and, and answer them live. However, I will make the same offer, which is if you would like any more information on any of this, post it in the comments. I will respond to you personally, or you may see, and or you may see uh, a presentation pop up on exactly your question going into more detail. So you will have it to reference for the future. Now, if you'd like to connect with me, you can. I kind of joke and say, it's like having a financial counselor in your back pocket um, because I'm always willing to share information on how you can improve your financial life. And I do that in lots of ways. You can find me on, uh, well, you can sign up for my newsletter and I will send them direct to you. So that's on drdebt.ca, my personal website. Um, we, uh, I'm going to tell you how you can connect with us too in a moment. Um, so pop on my website if you want. There's lots of great articles there. I share them in a very fun and personal way. Or you can follow me on Twitter. Uh, or you can email me. That's one of my emails, info at drdebt.ca. Um, but you can also connect with us. So I'm part of the Alan Marshall team. And uh, there's our toll-free number. Our website is wecanhelp.ca. And you know, we have a pretty cool tool on our website where you can sign up. I wish I could remember what it's called. I should have remembered that as I popped on here. Um, it's on the right hand side and you sign up and you it's a four part series of how you can improve your finances and you get one email a day. I hope I'm not completely butchering that. It's been a while since I've looked at it, uh, but it's a pretty neat little free feature that you can sign up for. And uh, and of course, you can contact me there as well, which I did not put on the slide, but it's Mary Ann, M-A-R-Y, A-N-N, at wecanhelp.ca. All right, so there you go. Thank you very much. And I'm going to stop share so I can just pop on and say, 
by wishing you all happy, healthy finances, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.